why did I come through this Maps of Meaning track mm -hmm. to get into Bitcoin and the stories and, and everything else that we're covering in here? Nowhere is it mentioning, first of all, praxeology, Austrian economics. None of that right. gets actually touched on. But of course, it's not a Bitcoin book. It came out before Bitcoin yep. existed. Mm -hmm. But it does touch on concepts that are reflected. Yes. And something like Bitcoin fits in perfectly mm -hmm. as this stabilizing map, uh, a map of the world that we can all share. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Sir Luke, welcome back to the What Is Money show. Thanks, Rob. Great to be here again. Looking forward to this one. Yeah, very excited. We have had quite the captivating conversations the past few times, so I'm sure this one will be uh, quite similar. We're going to continue our journey into Jordan Peterson's first book, Maps of Meaning. Um, we'll be getting into chapters three and perhaps four today. We'll see how long it takes us to work our way through. Um, but before we did that, we were going to hit on a few of these topics we're just talking about offline, um, that we've talked about on prior episodes, but th thought it was a good opportunity to jump into some of these deep end concepts that are very much at the edge of my own understanding and may even be tenuous links between Peterson's work and praxeology, but still I think they're interesting and things I'm thinking about. So I wanted to try and talk about them with you and see if we can break some ground. Um, so I'm going to start, and we, we did discover there's a slight page difference between your, I guess you have a physical copy of the book, and I have a PDF, and they were matching and page number until a certain point. So at a certain point, they're a couple of pages off, but I'm going to be uh, using the page numbers off of my PDF, but there might be a two page difference from uh, the physical book just for the audience who might be following along. So I'm starting on page 137 and this, he's talking about the dragon of primordial chaos, which we explored in prior episodes. And he's going... Peterson's going into, I guess, describing myth as like a compilation of metaphorical statements about reality, something like that. Like we've talked about the importance of metaphor 
how it is essential to our language. It's like metaphors are built into words. The example I commonly cite is the word understand, to stand beneath, to get a deeper perspective. Uh, it's also built into all of our phrases. When you say something like set the oven on 400 degrees, you're invoking like a table or a surface metaphor. And then also it's the reason you're saying set it on is like you're, you're going from zero to 400 is going up, right? We're going up in degrees. You're not actually going up. You're just increasing the temperature. But we have this metaphor in mind that, well, the surface of the table is higher than the surface of the floor. So we say set the oven on 400 degrees. Obviously, you're not setting the oven anywhere. You're you're switching it to a state of higher temperature, something like that. Um, so anyways, metaphor, very essential to how we think and talk. And then we describe mythology as like this part of the coming online process for human beings. And then... So it seems to me telling that Peterson's calling myth a compilation of metaphorical statements, something like that. So I'll read a couple of excerpts here, um, and then I'll just start going through some of these thoughts that I'm having, and we'll see what comes out of it. So, okay, page 137 for me in the PDF. Peterson writes... And I'm going to be jumping around a little bit, but these are all excerpts from that page. He writes, The metaphorical statements of myth work because unknown or partially known things inevitably share characteristics of importance with somewhat more thoroughly investigated, comprehended, and familiar things. A little further down, he writes, Metaphor links thing to thing, situation to situation, concentrating on the phenomenological, affective, functional, and motivational features the linked situations share. Through such linkage, what might otherwise remain entirely mysterious can begin to become comprehended. A little further down, he writes, The process of metaphorical representation provides a bridge and an increasingly communicable bridge between that, between what can be directly explored, experienced, and comprehended, and what remains eternally unknown. So, again, metaphor, the etymology of the word metaphor means something like to carry over. So a metaphor lets us carry over our experience from one domain into another in which it is relevant. Uh, It lets us infer commonalities of experience, you might say. Um, And money lets us, and this is where I'm trying to link, money has a sort of similar structure to metaphor in that it lets us abstract away irrelevant details, say that led to the emergence of supply and demand, and it lets us look at everything in a common language, like a price or, you know, someone's net worth, something like that. And what I'm saying, when I say it lets you ignore all the irrelevant details, is like, you don't need to know uh, safety and hits is good in the Bitcoin standard. He's like, if there's the price of copper goes up, you're incentivized as a producer to produce more and you're incentivized as a consumer to consume less or find substitutes. You don't need to know why, right? You don't need to know there was an earthquake that broke down the copper mine or the ship with copper sank or whatever. You don't need to know any of the information that led to that shift in the relationship between supply and demand. You just need to see the shift in the price. So it's, you're carrying over what's relevant to human action and and distilling it just into the price. Okay, so now this is going to go into a bit of some complicated territory but one of the things i would like to say about the price before we go there so the price is very interesting because the price we describe, i guess first of all before i do that do you have any thoughts you want to throw in because i'm going to go on this whole thing about price yeah sure well the main points here with the the metaphor i think the the reason this is being discussed just to put this into a little bit of context here is that He's talking about the dragon of primordial chaos as we're we're talking about this, and one of the the reasons or the the symbols for this is that 
metaphor comes from kind of this totality of potential, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it's the way that helps us cut through the symbolic idea of what is out there when we can't even describe it. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then we start to to cut the world down into these areas. First of all, the the unknown we can sort of get our head around, the known, the unknown. Then we bring that into the area of the known, but then we have these linguistic these the linguistic concepts that pull this together. And so the the linkage between myth and metaphor and the idea that it's it's a way of making sense of the chaos. Yes. I think those are those are the the powerful linkages here. And so I will I'll toss it back to you to continue with the the price here, but just contextualizing it with the rest of our discussion, that's where he's coming from here, I think. Yes. No, that's a great, great input there and it, what came up for me is another thing to think about this is very strange um metaphor actually changes as our technology changes like i just mentioned kind of the table metaphor right well you can't have a table metaphor until you build tables um we, today we say things like oh that's a feature not a bug okay well that metaphor makes sense in 2023 it didn't make any sense in 1993 right? Because the technological reality we inhabit has changed. So now we can say that about someone's personality, for instance, right? You, you take your understanding of a computer or software, and you can import that into a conversation about someone's personality, right? So, so there's this carrying over effect. And so that's just another interesting thing to think about that we, the metaphors, the, again, if metaphor is, is essential to human cognition, thinking, then as we change the world, right, we create new tools, new technologies that were then in turn changing the way we think about and metaphorize our experience of reality, which then allows us to create more tools. So there's a strange feedback loop occurring between human cognition and tool making, basically. Um, and Merchia, uh, Merchia Eliad and his History of Religious Ideas talks about this. He talks about how mythologies sort of echo the technological realities of every society that generates them, right? So if you're a hunter-gatherer culture, well, they have hunting called hunting mythologies, basically. And a lot of it has to do with the tools and techniques of hunting, for instance. Okay, I'll put that one down. Back to the price. So we said money kind of functions as a metaphor when it conveys prices and that it lets us carry over information that's relevant without needing to know the backstory, basically. You can just see the movement and the price, and that's all you need to know. Here's what's weird about price. It's neither subjective nor objective. Now, I'm going to just sit with that one for a minute. Most people think, right, reality is primarily, there's objective reality, you know, the outside world, the things that move independent of human uh, interpretation. And then there is the psychological reality, the internal reality that interprets and symbolizes and communicates about objective world. However, the price is neither one of these things because it is the intersection point of objective supply, right? There is objectively a certain supply of goods or capital in the world, depending on what you're pricing. And then there's a subjective configuration of demand superimposed on that supply. So the price itself is neither subjective nor objective. Now, someone might want to get uh, critical here and they say, well, actually, the price is objective because what you're saying in the price is what is the last cleared trade or the last executed trade of money for that good, basically, right? Copper exchanged hands the most the last time the most recent time copper changed hands it was at twenty dollars an ounce whatever it is they would say that's an objective fact and while i would agree okay so price is objective in that sense that fails to account for speculation right that people are looking at that price and they're anticipating future demand and supply changes and through their buying and selling actions they're injecting that information into the price. So there's this forward-looking intersubjective aspect to the price that you can't get rid of, right? So although it may be objective in practice, it's not entirely 
these are these are like orders of intentionality, by the way. So it's like, well, I'm thinking what he thinks. Does he know what I know that he knows that I like? When you start doing like this, you can you're thinking intersubjectively, basically. And there's that is a component of the price at all times and all places. Okay, so that's strange. Price is neither subjective nor objective. I'll throw it back to you for a second because I'm going to go into another strange domain after this um, to connect to that notion of price being. Oh, and last point. Verveke uses the term transjective to describe things that are neither objective nor subjective. The other example he likes to give is adaptivity, right? That obviously there are objective selection pressures in nature, but there's also sexual selection, right? So there's an objective component and a subjective component to adaptivity. Um, any thoughts you want to share before we I go to the next strange point? Yeah, so I'm, I mean, I think the price is the distillation, right, of all of this information, like you're saying, into the, the most compact form possible. And this absolutely parallels everything we've been talking about, how mythology and stories distill the core message of narrative down to its most important elements and of sure. course they're distinguishable by culture and i would i would give the the example the parallel to this would be that each currency or each market is its own culture so to say sure. with its own quirks and its own ways of ways of working ways of interpreting not to strain the metaphor too hard again talking about metaphor the 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 thing here is that the price becomes the way of abstracting away all of this stuff that you don't need to, to care about, right? So if you don't need to care about why the price is a certain level, well, then then you can much more easily make the choice of how to act. What do you want to do? Here are all the prices. Here are all the things. Yes. And so when we get into that, if the money system is distorted, well, then that's just going to mess with the entire thing, right? You you talked about that the supply is objective. Well, okay, that's great. If the supply is objective, but the supply of money that the price is denominated in is not uh -huh. fixed, is not objective, then what are we doing? Exactly. The whole the whole thing gets gets messed up. And so I mean that ties it into everything we're talking about about the nature of money and and the Bitcoin of it all. But that's I think the the parallel here to myth being this distillation and and then to to take it to to another level as well when the the myths start going away from the core point into the realm of ideology something we're mm -hmm. going to get into a little bit today when when they start losing the key elements and straying away from the the full picture well then that myth gets distorted it's not telling you the full picture anymore mm -hmm. it's not telling you something that is true to the entire nature of reality so right. lots of parallels there again yes no it's a lot of good points i really like the data compression feature of pricing that myth also exhibits that's very interesting um so these are oof yeah i don't know just narrative structure i don't know what you call pricing a narrative structure i don't know it's something that tells you well, mythology is kind of giving you the how to act and pricing is telling you within what bounds can you act, right? Like you have a certain reserve of money and things cost a certain price. It's kind of giving you the scope of action that's possible for you. Um, so that's, yeah, interesting, interesting stuff there. Okay, so subject-object duality is not primary, as we've just talked about with well, the price, right? There are things that are neither subjective nor objective like the price, like adaptivity itself. I now want to jump over to an excerpt from a different book, which I talked about with Knut um, in our interview at Lugano together, which is Economic Science and the Austrian Method by Hans Hermann Hoppe. And he has a passage in this book uh, that I think explains why subject-object duality and by extension, causality are not primary realities, that in fact, they are subcategories of human action. So I'm going to read a couple of excerpts here. Hoppe writes, 
our mental categories have to be understood as ultimately grounded in categories of action. And as soon as this is recognized, all idealistic suggestions immediately disappear. Instead, an epistemology claiming the existence of true synthetic a priori propositions becomes a realistic epistemology. And this side note, I, what he's referring to there is things like man must act, that these become um, true ways for generating knowledge, that we can actually say things about reality that aren't based on observation, but are based on self-reflection instead. Continuing with the excerpt, since it is understood as ultimately grounded in categories of action, the gulf between the mental and the real outside physical world is bridged. As categories of action, they must be mental things as much as they are characteristics of reality, for it is through actions that the mind and reality make contact. So the mind-blowing perspectival shift here for me is to even perceive, right, to to have the experience of sight or hearing is a human action, right? These are means to an end, right? You're, you're using vision to us to establish a purpose in the world and move towards it, right? Whether you're trying to catch food or find shelter or whatever it may be. Um, to think a thought, to speak a word, these are all means to an end, means to an end, right? So we're constantly, we're saying that all of these things are subcategories of human action, perception, thought, etc. And so as I read this here, he doesn't invoke the terms. He, he says mind and reality or uh, mental things and reality. I'm reading this as subject and object. Subject, the subjective domain and the objective domain, these are just categorical structures we use to simplify reality. Right? There are certain aspects of reality that are agnostic to human affairs, right? Like every time we freeze water, it freezes at zero degrees centigrade. That doesn't seem like a matter of opinion. And then there are um, things that are more subjective or psychological, right? Like, oh, I love this novel. Well, this is a good movie. This is not a good movie. Things like that. But those categories only come into being through action. Like, as we use them as means to an end of some kind, right? The, 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 the end of communication or, or whatever it may be. So it's the punchline here is that perhaps pricing is not subject is neither subjective nor objective because subject object duality is a subcategory of human action. Action is primary. Then you have these categorical structures. Okay crazy just things to ponder right i don't it's 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 out there um any thoughts on that because i want there's one other point he makes on causality i want to hit and then we can move on that's fascinating right i mean i mean well you read that once offline and then a second time here live and it's like both times it's like yeah that's that's quite the quite the passage to to think about here and the the, the place that instantly takes me is what is the mind what is consciousness, right? And and this is this is coming from a, um not uninformed place, but definitely I'm not an expert in the neurochemistry side of it. But th everything maps to the idea of that the the brain, the control mechanism, the nervous system really is responding to external external stimuli, really the environment, and then the actions done to it by the organism that has the brain, has the consciousness, right? And so what is the nature of that really, right? If we go back all the way to to single-celled organisms and, and all this, it's like, are they running that same loop over right. and over? It, this, actually, this actually reminds me of a, a slightly funny uh, thing I saw, actually, that, that Jordan Peterson posted that was that uh, well at, at least i saw it that he was the one that posted but it was something that if moore's law the the law that computing power um, a shorthand for the the technological capabilities of of computing this this not human uh 
if if Moore's law is is extrapolated back into the past, uh-huh. then then humanity or life on Earth would have started something like five billion years before Earth even existed, yeah. right? And this just led me to that the gap there. There's some kind of gap there that I think is is being hit by this observation of environment and observation of action. And then this machine, this brain, this nervous system Mm -hmm. that is in every organism, it runs something, right? It runs some kind of consciousness loop and out comes the idea to act. So it, it all comes back to action, as you say. But then it's this feedback loop, right? And um, we we had a really good discussion. Uh, probably, actually, it's I guess it's coming out after this, but um, with um, a guy named Volker, a uh, translator into German of a bunch of of uh, Knut's books and a bunch of other books. Um, but a, a whole big thing on on free will uh, with me and Knut, and yeah, like just this this stuff is is mind blowing. It's that that the idea that the consciousness itself can it all com- it all comes back to to action and then yep. and then what's the implication of that right Th- this leads me to what is the implication of it all coming back down to action and i think these are the the points we're we're talking about here yeah and then this is the hard problem right what is consciousness it's like again the what is trying to look at what is the, what do we say about this Attempting to look at the looking glass, right? Instead of looking through the glasses, you're trying to look at the glasses. And it's a, it's this meta step. Same thing as like, tr- I think trying to say, what is money? Like you're trying to step out of the, the perceptual apparatus and describe the per- perceptual apparatus and it's difficult. Um, okay, not to get too far afield, but since we're here, I also, if that were not mind bending enough, subject object duality is not primary, but it is a subcategory of human action. Hoppe goes on shortly after that excerpt to say that Mises established that causality as well is a subcategory of human action. Causality is not primary. He writes uh, the following, yet it is Mises who brings this insight to the foreground. Causality, he realizes, is a category of action. To act means to interfere at some earlier point in time in order to produce some later result. And thus every actor must presuppose the existence of constantly operating causes. Causality is a prerequisite of acting, as Mises put it. So, (laughs) if subject-object were not primary enough for you, Uh, they're throwing out causality as well, saying that basically, again, human action, right? The the axiom, man must act. Humans must purposefully use means to pursue valued ends. To act is to intervene in the flow of events in the world, to try and redirect them, right, from where, what they are currently doing towards some other outcome, right? You uh, there's a f- stream with fish running down a, a, a mountainside. Well, you want to act by redirecting the stream to a small pond so you can just go scoop out the fish and eat them, right? So it's an there's an intervening uh, in the flow of events that is uh, a component or a, an essential component of action itself. So causality has to be like operating causes, as he says here, they have to be constantly operating causes have to be presupposed. You can't actually prove causality. And the the example I tried to give you offline, I think is every time we take water to zero degrees centigrade, it freezes. That doesn't prove that water always freezes at zero degrees centigrade. All we can say about it is that every time we do it, it happens. And so therefore we will assume that every time into the future, it will continue to happen. But we don't know. We don't we have not, there's no rational statement you can make about, no irrefutable statement uh, or axiom you can make that water will always freeze at zero degrees centigrade. Whereas the statement like man must act is an irrefutable axiom 
because to try and argue against it is to use the means of argumentation toward the end of refuting it. So to argue against the axiom of action, you invoke, you act, basically. So, uh, all right, now to get to the parallels, that may seem like quite the detour, but I want to now hit some parallels in uh, Peterson's work, Back to Maps of Meaning. And I'm going to go to page 139 now. Um, Peterson writes, Question. What is an object in the absence of a frame of reference? Answer. It is everything conceivable at once. It is something that constitutes the union of all currently discriminable opposites and something that cannot, therefore, be easily distinguished from nothing. I'm going to call an audible here and back up, actually, because I think there's one page before that. He gives a good description of what he means by that little synopsis. So I'm going back to 138. Any given object, a table, say, exist as a table because it is apprehended only in a very limited and restrained manner. Something is a table at a particular and isolated level of analysis specified by the nature of the observer. In the absence of this observer, one might ask, what is it that is being apprehended? Is the proper level of analysis and specification subatomic, atomic, or molecular, or all three at once? Should the table be considered an in indistinguishable element of the earth upon which it rests, or of the solar system which contains the earth, or of the galaxy itself? The same problem obtains from the perspective of temporality. What is now table was once tree, before that earth, before that rock, before that star. What is now table also has before it an equally complex and lengthy developmental history waiting in front of it. Notice the metaphor we're invoking here, right? Front, uh, talking about forward in time. It will be perhaps ash, then earth, then far enough in the future, part of the sun again, when the sun finally re-envelops the earth. The table is what it is only as a very narrow span only at a very, very narrow span of spatial and temporal resolution, the span that precisely characterizes our consciousness. So what is the table as an independent object, free, that is, of the restrictions that characterize the evidently limited human viewpoint? What is it that can be conceptualized at all spatial and temporal levels of this analysis simultaneously? Does the existence of the thing include its interactions with everything it influences and is influenced by gravitationally and electromagnetically? Is that thing, everything it once was, everything it is, and everything it will be, all at the same time? Where then are its borders? How can it be distinguished from other things? And without such distinction, in what manner can it be said to exist? Ooh, okay, so... All right, I'll, I'm I'm jumping around here. So, again, where do you where do you draw the line? Where is the objective table? Right, it's like it's all dependent kind of on your purpose or aims or ends. Right, a table. Another way to put this is like a table can be a tool for someone. Like I'm resting my laptop on a table right now to do this podcast with you, but it can equally and simultaneously be an obstacle for someone else. If you pay someone $100 to jump over the table, well, all of a sudden it's an obstacle, right? So there's a the motivational uh, significance, I guess, that sort of shapes how we perceive reality in addition to all the other um, variation Peterson described. So, all right, here's the excerpt that I think ties into subject-object duality and causality uh, specifically subject-object duality being a subcategory of human action. Uh, again, this is written by Peterson in Maps of Meaning, who has little to no knowledge of praxeology and is just explaining this through a mythological viewpoint. Peterson writes, I am not saying that there are no such things as things. That would, of course, be patently absurd. 
It is also fully apparent that the things we apprehend are rule-governed. The cosmos as we experience it is orderly and rationally comprehensible. What I am claiming is that objective things are in fact the product of an interaction between whatever constitutes our limited consciousness and whatever constitutes the unlimited background that makes up the world in the absence of a subject. This is a stance informed by mythology, in particular the myths of the origin. So there you have it, right? Where are objects and subjects? They don't appear to be primary, and it looks like mythology is sort of peeking beneath the surface, so to speak. And maybe, as we're, again, saying it through the perspective of Hoppe, we're describing human action, or maybe something more primary than that, I'm not sure, but it it, it certainly seems to be at least human action uh, that is deeper than subject-object itself. Yeah, this, this is a massive little section here, and and again, where it comes down to the the parallelism and the what what I love about this is just what you said at the end there is that is that Peterson was was writing this without a praxeological background and the the tie-ins to all of that, the the idea of that a creation myth kind of can explain this stuff or at least attempt to explain this stuff. This is this is where it gets into back to the sort of symbological part of it, right? But when we're talking about the, this unlimited background that makes up the world in the absence of the the subject, sure. this is this is in so many creation stories that there is just some kind of sure. formless void, some kind of sure. nothingness, and then the world forms out of that but it's always mm-hmm. in the in the format of of persons and then gods is the term sure but i mean the even the even the word god is it's it it comes from the germanic languages it's it's not the the word for for example the christian god they, there was an, another name for yahweh mm-hmm. right so they they were personifications. There was there was the concept of sort of a, a deity or a god or this figure that is is somehow higher up in the in the mythological structure than a simple individual. But they're personifications. They are. Mm-hmm. And you go back into even the Old Testament creation story. There's there's multiple creation stories there. First of all. Uh, the details on this, I, I I wouldn't be able to flip through this and and grab it just offhand. But but there's there's two creation stories basically in in Genesis, and one that was in the format of this there's nothingness, and then suddenly there's there's sort of something out of nothing. That's a separate yes. creation story to the one that is the entry into civilization, right? So there's something that is trying to be explained and and i think it, i think it's this this concept that the world needs to have a frame of reference for it to make sense period yeah right and so in the absence of that i, I mean it's 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 also that if a, a tree falls in the woods and there's no yeah, way to hear it right. it really happen right right that that you need to have an observer or the yes. and now, now we're getting into quantum quantum physics yes. and all this. Yeah, so so I mean the, the, this this entire thing is just is just wrapping up this this concept of frames of reference and metaphor and subject and object and I, I love the the parallels to praxeology because I, I think this ju- this just grounds the entire thing right it it shows that both of these sets of things are saying something fundamentally true. Mm-hmm. from different perspectives in different ways for different yes. reasons but we can we can learn something from the totality of them basically yes That's what I take from it yeah well said um and you know the other thing that strikes me there is the individual as a frame of reference right like adam god made adam name the animals right for instance, he had to like apply a frame of reference to them to sort of make them real. Like obviously there were animals before he named them, but they don't become this 
they don't become part of culture and language and this other human reality of relevance before he names them, right? They have to have names. And so it's just, there's the, you know, there's the ontological reality, which is what is, and then there's the nomological reality, which is what we call it, how we, how we map it basically. And so the individual as a frame of reference, the, the perceiving subject is what gives rise to the object, right? Based on motivational significance. And then the connection there is, well, also words are frames of reference. Money is a frame of reference. Again, these are perceptual tools. Um, and, you know, this reminds me of the beginning of the Bible, which we'll go into you and probably getting to the core of the logos itself. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. That, you know, it's, it's this, uh, and the Buddhists had this concept, the codependent origination, I think that things don't even exist independent of their relationship. Like the relationship is primary and the things are secondary. So these relational tools we're talking about, like the word, like money, like the living individual that mediates between heaven and earth, right? Ideas and physical reality were somehow essential, right? And we're made in God's image. We are the logos itself. So really interesting stuff. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technologies. iCoin has released a free software update for all existing wallet holders that includes a secure messaging feature called Chamber. With the Chamber upgrade, you can send text messages with all the security benefits of a cold device. With wallet-to-wallet -wallet encrypted messaging, there is zero chance of a message being decrypted by a snooping third party. Chamber's encrypted messages can only be created and read on an iCoin wallet, which means messages are never seen in plain text on a hot device. You can use any messaging platform to send chamber encrypted messages. Even if the messaging channel is compromised, your messages will remain uncrackable. You can now generate and store your message encryption keys on a cold device. This means you become the central authority and your encryption keys are never seen on a network connected device or kept in cloud storage by a third party. So why not protect your private communications like you protect your Bitcoin private keys? Pick up a few iCoin chambers today for friends, family, and coworkers. With the iCoin Chamber, your privacy is built right in. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Should we jump to page 218 where he talks about um, subjugation, basically, and uh, uh, as a metaphor, the metaphor of apprenticeship for subjugation? Yeah, to the to the start of what we prepped for forty minutes yes. in. I love it. I love it. I love that we can just go into go into all these directions and all this. So, you know, um in for the long haul. I love it. Um yeah, I and mean so so this is the start of chapter three and and the chapter is called Apprenticeship and Enculturation. Subtitled The Adoption of a Shared Map and I love this chapter because it's starting to get into a little bit more of why this stuff really matters. Mm -hmm. Again, with the the word matter, we won't get into that again. But mm -hmm. it's a, it's a dense chapter and uh, and a a really interesting chapter. So yeah, let's let's do it. Okay, um, I'll read long excerpt from the first 
page of the chapter here. Peterson writes, subjugation to lawful authority might be more reasonably considered in light of the metaphor of the apprenticeship. Childhood dependency must be replaced by group membership prior to the development of full maturity. Such membership provides society with another individual to utilize as a quote-unquote tool and provides the maturing but still vulnerable individual with necessary protection with a group-fostered identity. The capacity to abide by social rules regardless of the specifics of the discipline can therefore be regarded as a necessary transitional stage in the movement from childhood to adulthood. Discipline should therefore be regarded as a skill that may be developed through adherence to strict ritual or by immersion within a strict belief system or hierarchy of values. Once such discipline has been attained, it may escape the bounds of its developmental precursor. It is this manner that true freedom, it is in this manner that true freedom is attained. It is at this level of analysis that all genuine religious and cultural traditions and dogmas are equivalent, regardless of content. They are all masters whose service, whose service may culminate in the development of self-mastery and consequent transcendence of tradition and dogma. Apprenticeship is necessary but should not, on that account, be glamorized. Dogmatic systems make harsh and unreasonable masters, systems of belief and moral action, and those people who are identified with them are concerned above all with self-maintenance and preservation of predictability and order. The necessarily conservative tendencies of great systems makes them tyrannical, and more than willing to crush the spirit of those they quote-unquote serve. Apprenticeship is a precursor to freedom, however, and nothing necessary and worthwhile is without danger. Woo! Um, So, yeah, big introduction. Um, I'm going to throw it over to you, but where I wanted to go next was the the Nietzsche... um, perspective on this which is which starts on page 221 yeah i love this i mean first of all just talking about discipline subject subjugation to a lawful authority this stuff wouldn't have been controversial i i don't even know 10 years ago really? definitely 20 years ago and it, it it really digs into that the concept of discipline and and doing the work and going through the process of becoming an individual that is capable of doing something this is not easy and this is something that grew all of the constructions of culture basically to support because yes. we can we can get into like after the the Nietzsche point which yeah I really like that one there's there are par- parallels here as well with the the development of how a child basically goes from child to adolescent to like adult, mm-hmm. and those are, those are actually very much distinguished phases of of being here. Th- those the fact that there are different terms for those things isn't isn't arbitrary. You are a child or an infant, and then you are an adolescent, and then you are an adult, and those those things mean very different things. And so it, it just just the the first part though that I, I just love about this is that this entire chapter is building the case for why it is important to have discipline and why it is important to grow into the culture that you live in. And yep. and so that that sort of does imply or even demand that an individual is limited by the culture that they are born into. Uh-huh. Yes. But it also means that that by going through the the tyranny of culture, by by submitting to the tyranny of culture, the end process can be the individual, which is capable of becoming the hero, which is capable of going out into the unknown and finding something new. So right. it's almost this it's almost this cultural incubation system for yes. another metaphor, but almost literal. Yeah. literal in this case to take individuals to to make individuals that are capable of going and advancing the culture 
Mm-hmm. Well said. Well said. Um, and, and, oh man, it's, it's, a, it's a strange one because as he's saying that, you know, you shouldn't glamorize these dogmatic, tyrannical systems that it's not like justification for them. But on the other hand, you know, nothing worthwhile comes without some hardship or sacrifice. And so the, the, and this is an example I picked up from Peterson in one of his lectures, uh, where he's describing a pianist that's striving to become really good, right? Well, to learn how to play the piano, you have to really tyrannize yourself, basically, right? Just to can keep repeating the motions slavishly, right? Keep doing this motion over and over and over and over and over and over, you know, through self-discipline in this case, uh, or possibly with the help, obviously, of a, a, a teacher that might be a little tyrannical as well. Um, but the end goal of that is that you are free flowing, effortless, effortlessly playing the piano creatively and competently on the stage, right? So there's this, there's this precursor stage of oppression and, uh, rigor and, um, self-discipline or even external discipline that's necessary to build yourself towards that that phase of, of freedom and competence and and whatnot. So, um, again, not a justification, more of just like an observation of how systems work. And this going into Nietzsche's perspective on this, he had a view that Christianity was sort of a you know they they call this the apprenticeship, the, the philosophy of apprenticeship that you need to have this oppression before you can have this freedom. And so Nietzsche's as a perspective that Christianity had to apprentice people really to focus on a common aim or to operate within a, a large hierarchy before something like the scientific revolution could occur, right? Before we could liberate ourselves. Um, and I'll read a little bit here. Nietzsche has been casually regarded as a great enemy of Christianity. I believe, however, that he was consciously salutary in that role. When the structure of an institution has become corrupt, particularly according to its own principles, it is the act of a friend to criticize it. Nietzsche is also viewed as fervid as fervid individualist and social revolutionary, as the prophet of the Superman and the ultimate destroyer of tradition. He was, however, much more sophisticated and complex than that. He viewed the intolerable discipline of the Christian church, which he despised, as a necessary and admirable precondition to the freedom of the European spirit, which he regarded as not yet fully realized. There is a long excerpt here from Nietzsche himself. Um, I'll just read a piece of the end here. He wrote that, that for thousands of years, European thinkers thought merely in order to prove something. Today, conversely, we suspect every thinker who wants to prove something, that the conclusions that ought to be the result of their most rigorous reflection were always settled from the start, just as it used to be with Asiatic astrology and still is today with the innocuous Christian moral interpretation of our most intimate personal experiences for the glory of God and for the salvation of the soul. This tyranny, this caprice, this rigorous and grandiose stupidity has educated the spirit. Slavery is, as it seems, both in the cruder and in more subtle sense, the indispensable means of spiritual discipline and cultivation too. Consider any morality with his with this in mind, that there is an in it of nature teaches hatred of the laissez aller of any all too great freedom, and implants the need for limited horizons and the nearest task, teaching the narrowing of our perspective, and thus, in a certain sense of stupidity, as a condition of life and growth. So, and the, the laissez aller he defined earlier, um, uh, the laissez aller, I'm not actually sure of the definition, but it's just kind of like the free, he's saying uh, morality as opposed to the laissez, I guess like the free actor, something like that. Um, 
so what like this idea and then at the bottom here peterson writes this is the philosophy of apprentice apprenticeship useful for conceptualizing the necessary relationship between subordination to a potent historically constructed social institution and the eventual development of true freedom so the idea i have here is that you know you have to kind of like you need to put pressure and heat on the water before it boils over way, right? Like it needs to be, you have to subject yourself to this schedule, this, this training, this, uh, you know, like when you're working out, right? If you want to become really same analogy as the pianist, if you want to be really become strong and good and free moving with the weights or competent in the gym, it's like, well, you have to subject yourself to kind of this slavish work for a long period of time before you can develop that. And so, uh, what is that? What is that funny saying? Like, if you want to grow, sometimes you have to be buried in shit. You know, it's something like that. It's, it's, and I don't, this doesn't, I don't want to justify, obviously, these oppressive systems or justify slavery for God's sake. We should always resist it and fight against it. But it's something like we need Growth requires this oppositional force. You need something to push against for it to work. So it's more of a, this isn't a prescriptive thing. It's not like saying, oh, this should be or should not be. It's more descriptive to saying like, this is, seems to be how systems work. They need something to push against to go any direction. Um, and so, yeah, you know, if we look at, Bitcoin, maybe Bitcoin could only emerge as a consequence of the centuries of central banking, oppression, and monetary manipulation we've had. You know, you needed, well, you needed to forge these individuals along the way, right? It's well, Jesus driving the money changers out of the temple, and then Jesus is crucified, but then Jesus cements the individual as the primary social unit. And then, you know, you fast forward, Christianity takes over the Western world. Fast forward, you get Ayn Rand, right? You get Mises, you get people writing about the the importance of liberal ideology and individualism. And then you get Satoshi Nakamoto and Bitcoin, right? Like there had to be this structure that was pushing down that these, you know, either prophetic or philosophical literary individuals had to push up against um for for freedom to emerge so anyways just a, i just thought that was so fascinating like as much as we talk about freedom and propound freedom there might be a whole flip side to this that we don't talk about enough is like well for freedom to emerge there needed to be some pressure in the opposite direction in the first place yeah i mean i think this this point is easily one of the most controversial things within the within the framework as you say of uh-huh. freedom and consensualism libertarianism whatever and the thing about that is uh, as you say the, the entire book is is descriptive to me and and uh-huh. and the the main point with that is that recognizing that there is a way that individuals have been formed in the past that maybe we have to continue doing that into the future or that's a that's a bad framing that maybe the individual should consider the lessons of the past in informing their future behavior yeah freedom being the ability to do whatever you want Mm -hmm. doesn't mean you should do everything you're free to do right right and the going down to first first of all just some some ground rules on that not aggressing anyone else, not harming others or harming property. First of all, just not doing those things. Okay, sure. good. But there are things that are self-harmful directly. You know, you, you're free to jump off that cliff, but you probably shouldn't. Right. <laughs> Down to other levels, you are free to spend your day doing nothing but playing video games, eating Cheetos and uh, other things that, that don't advance you whatsoever. Right. But maybe you shouldn't do that, right? So same thing here with the so-called tyrannical culture there. 
it, it this is just saying to me that that there has to be some form of group that brings the individual up to the place where there is a baseline. Yeah. This speaks directly to me to the difficulties of meaning of maybe maybe it's my generation to to a start I'm a younger millennial to to say the generation Z all this yeah like the, this this lack of meaning here I think there's something too that with society going hands off and also the breakdown in the traditional family unit less the- and less families staying together both parents in the workplace or not together at all something like that those things i think have contributed to the breakdown in this apprenticeship uh-huh. system the uh-huh. way of bringing children up in some kind of structure to give them a baseline uh-huh. and then children look for meaning everywhere in in that absence and i think that's where you find kids trying to find any group that will give them some belonging on the internet and then suddenly there's a massive rise in uh controversial uh emergent phenomenon that might be self-harmful to kids yeah. i don't want to get you demonetized so i won't say certain uh, things no no so <laughs> no so so but the the uh the main thing there is is that i think that's that's the emergence there yep. is is that in the absence of a stable yeah it says in the absence of a stable social environment that children cannot cannot grow into fully formed right. free adults right, right. so so the, the context here is important i don't think this is saying at all that individuals should subject themselves to tyranny forever it's saying that individuals should subject themselves to the tyranny of their culture long enough for them mm-hmm. to get a baseline. Yeah. When I first found all this stuff, all this stuff, mm-hmm. Jordan Peterson generally, Maps and Meaning, everything, I just didn't have this baseline myself. Yeah. This was what I was looking for. Yeah. I needed something to tell me that there is a value in these parts of society that, as Nietzsche said, he's, he despised it. Yeah. But then he found it necessary. Yes. And that's where we need to get to, I think, is is uh, ex- giving giving it out to the individual to to, of course, make their own decisions and make make their choices, but mm-hmm. maybe saying, Hey, here are some things that have worked in the past. Maybe you want that's to give that a try. One hundred percent. This is the transmission again of cultural knowledge right it's like these are things that have worked for a lot of people over a long period of time and although you are a rebellious teenager and might think you don't need to whatever do your chores go to football practice whatever it may be maybe it actually is good for you right so you and it's not to say and i don't think i mean obviously as a child you are somewhat oppressed or tyrannized by your parents, but that's obviously necessary. Children can't raise themselves, but but it's done, if it's done lovingly, it's done with the aim of that child becoming a self-sovereign, self-directed adult, right? So you're, you're just trying to teach them the useful lessons that they can then carry forward and pass on to their children and so forth. So I don't know that it, again, language is tricky here. It doesn't necessarily... Maybe it has to be more tyrannical in the beginning. Like with your two-year-old, you need to be pretty ruthless. But with your 12-year-old, you can be a little bit more uh, conversational and understanding and liberal with them, right? You can trust them to do more things because they're they're coming online, so to speak. Um, so it, it definitely needs to be constraining, right? The, the, the oppressive and tyranny aspect, I think, might be too strong of a word, I would never say submit to the tyranny of your culture, but you might want to say submit to the constraints of your culture. And indeed, if we're talking about personal growth, it is in the resistance to tyranny or oppression that you're going to grow, right? So it's not, we're not saying submit, (laughs) obviously. Um, And, uh, you know, this is, what's the old saying that constraints breed creativity? 
you know, it's it's the the laws of physics and gravity, right? They're fixed and unchangeable, so we don't go out and try to like change them. We just try to adapt and overcome. Like we we get creative, right? We figure out, oh, if the air moves faster under the bottom of the wing than it does the top of the wing. I'm sorry, it moves faster over the top of the wing than it does the bottom of the wing, then we create lift and we can fly and we can, you know, you adapt to the laws and your you creativity, right? And so even in that in that sense, Bitcoin is one of these structures, right? Obviously it's not oppressive or tyrannical because you use it or or you don't use it. It's just it's there. But it is constraining without a doubt, right? The one of the core value propositions of Bitcoin is that you can't print money. And that is a constraint humans desperately need, I think, to mature as a species. So um yeah, very controversial idea tricky to talk about but i think again one a very fundamental description of complex systems that you need some static structure to have dynamism right you if you're going to throw a ball you need to have a firm foot on the ground right this is the what did what did archimedes say give me a a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and i'll move the world right you need a strong static point to have maximum dynamism. And so this there's something uh in this in this philosophy that echoes that, I think. Well, so I have got two points here. So I one is actually going kind of right back to the to the start here in terms of the the creativity, the playing the piano. Just just um, to to really dive into that specifically is that for example, a, a Mozart, a prodigy, right? There are people who this doesn't apply to, right? And and I don't I don't mean that categorically. I mean that in some specific domain, someone just has their brain wired that they can do this thing. Mozart uh-huh. was wired for music. He could yes. he could play not just the piano. The, the piano seems to be unique, uniquely well suited to teaching and to. Uh, composing music it, it just it, something about that it's 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 one of these meta things yeah. meta instrument that's just very good for that but but usually these ultra well um th- these composers that, that do it so well they, usually they played other instruments i think mozart did violin at least They're... but but the, the thing here is that is that child prod prod prodigy or oh like if they're good at, at one specific area, then the constraints, first of all, should not apply. And I'm being prescriptive there, but also in the sense of that the past experience dictates that, well, maybe give them a pass and let's see what they can do. Uh-huh. Chess prodigies are similar. You just let them run with it. And then an eight-year-old wins the, the European tournament with adults. I think that actually just happened. So, so what this leads to is that what those people, these prodigies kind of have is something in the brain is just somehow wired for that. I I think Uh that they don't have to do all this disciplinary work to make it effortless, right? Right. So the reason I, the entire reason to bring this up is to say that most people aren't that. Yeah. The vast majority of people aren't that. Yeah. As great to find the thing that you love. The the thing that you love, I think, takes less effort to yeah. get good at because you enjoy it, something mm-hmm. like that. But that's not the same thing as not having to put in the work, uh-huh. having to put in the time. And then so that so so that means that, that this this structure of having to to kind of do the work First of all, it applies to almost everyone, but but the end goal should be kept in mind, right? Uh, I, I having to, a couple of discussions about the, just the nature of education. This is something that comes up a lot in the in the space. And it's like, what is the point of making kids memorize <laughs> some arcane way of doing long division, for example, when yeah. we've got calculators to do it now? <laughs> right? What's the actual point? Are they learning to do the math problem or are they learning to run an algorithm that is actually no no longer useful right 
so the, so the idea is the end goal needs to be kept in mind here, right? That, well, the end goal of discipline is the creation of the free individual. <laughs> so the tyranny the should, I, I hate words, using the word should, but the, 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 <laughs> what follows from the descriptions of the past, the description is that, is that the tyranny, the tyrannical culture uh -huh. should not eventually at the end inhibit the freedom of the individual. Yeah. That's what this says to me. That's yeah. end of point one. I'll let, I'll let you comment. No, I think it's a great point. And the only thing I would add is that even for those prodigies, I'm thinking of like Kobe Bryant, right? One of the greatest basketball players of all time, gifted in basically every way you can to be a basketball player, also notoriously self-disciplined, like insanely hard worker in the gym, practicing a shot thousands of times. So like, it depends on what level you want to play at. Cause like you can have all the talent in the world, be the bi biggest prodigy in the world. But if you want to be the best, you know, and you really want to operate at that level, you still need these disciplinary constraining frameworks to push, to push that talent even further. Um, so yeah, I don't know there's, you know, it's a, it's paradoxical in a way, but discipline or self-discipline is freedom or a pathway to freedom. And, um, yeah, very, very interesting. Just interesting. I think to, to look at it that way. One of my highest health priorities is keeping my brain in top shape to take care of my brain power. I do many things such as striving to read, write, exercise, and meditate daily. One of the latest tools in my brain power toolkit is MindLab Pro. MindLab Pro is a nootropic supplement that is scientifically proven to enhance your brain power. When I take MindLab Pro, my mind feels like it has a better grip on the world. My thinking is more lucid and the articulation of my speech is much more clear. MindLab Pro has been tested in rigorous, double-blind, placebo-controlled human trials and has been proven to enhance brain power for users in every age group. MindLab Pro is an advanced formulation of 11 nootropic ingredients and is backed by research from 1,473 human trials conducted over a period of 32 years. So if you're looking to start enhancing your brain power, MindLab Pro is an excellent solution. Go to mindlabpro.com slash breedlove to start enhancing your brain power today. Again, that's mindlabpro.com slash breedlove. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a crowdfunding platform for paying medical expenses in lieu of an insurance policy. CrowdHealth recently announced that it is integrating Lightning payments with Breeze's Lightning SDK. In the United States, we spend more than twice the average amount of money on healthcare than other developed nations. Medical costs are one of the leading causes of bankruptcy in the United States, and it is not a secret that the medical system in the U.S. has many, many issues. The CrowdHealth model is based on offering an alternative to the conventional insurance policy at a cheaper price point. For a monthly membership fee of $50, CrowdHealth will negotiate medical bills to get the cheapest price possible, help locate healthcare providers, offer access to their member crowdfunding service, and more. Prior to the Breeze integration, CrowdHealth had been functioning over traditional fiat payment rails, which introduced unnecessary transaction fees and delays in settlement. By integrating Lightning payments into the CrowdHealth business model, payments between members can now be made with near zero fees and with final settlement occurring in mere seconds. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove today to sign up. Okay, jumping back in here, we're looking at, still looking at chapter three, apprenticeship and enculturation subtitle adoption of a shared map and i'm going to read a couple of we're jumping around again uh, i'm going to read a couple of different paragraphs now one is the initial intro paragraph to the chapter and then one uh, probably like the fifth paragraph down peterson writes ideologies may be regarded as incomplete myths as partial stories whose compelling nature is a consequence of the appropriation of mythological ideas. The philosophy attributing individual evil to the pathology of social force constitutes one such partial story. Although society, the great father, has a tyrannical aspect, he also shelters, protects, trains, and disciplines the developing individual, 
and places necessary constraints on his thought, emotion, and behavior, which is what we just talked about. Um, jumping now to the fifth paragraph down, we are all familiar with the story of benevol benevolent nature threatened by the rapacious forces of the corrupt individual and the society of the machine. The plot is solid. The characters believable. But Mother Nature is also malarial mosquitoes, parasitical worms, cancer, and sudden infant death syndrome. The story of peaceful and orderly tradition undermined by the incautious and decadent with the ever-present threat of chaos lurking in the background is also familiar and compelling and true, except that the forces of tradition, however protective, tend to be blind and to concern themselves more with their own stability than with the well-being of those subject to them. We have all heard and identified with the story of the brave pioneer additionally, plow in hand, determined to wrest the good life and the stable state from the intransigent forces of nature. Although we may be sporadically aware that the intransigent forces shaped so heroically included the decimated original inhabitants of our once foreign landscape. We all know, finally, the story of the benevolent individual, genuine and innocent denied access to the nourishing forces of the true and natural world, corrupted by the unreasonable strictures of society. This tale has its adherence as well, not least because it is reassuring to believe that everything quote-unquote bad stems from without rather than within. And a little further down in the following paragraph, well, actually, I'll just continue into the next paragraph. These stories are all ideologies, and there are many more of them. Ideologies are attractive, not least to the educated modern mind, credulous despite its skepticism, particularly if those who embody or otherwise promote them allow the listener every opportunity to identify with the creative and positive characters of the story and to deny their association with the negative. Ideologies are powerful and dangerous. Their power stems from their incomplete but effective appropriation of mythological ideas. Their danger stems from their attractiveness in combination with their incompleteness. Ideologies tell only part of the story, but tell that part as if it were complete. This means that they do not take into account vast domains of the world. It is incautious to act in the world as if only a set of constituent elements exist. The ignored elements conspire, so to speak, as a consequence of their repression and make their existence known inevitably in some undesirable manner. So I've got some thoughts on that, but I'll throw it over to you first. And the last thing I would say is this whole thing where the difference between the ideology and mythology is completeness. The ideology is incomplete, but representing itself as if it were complete, which echoes back to my favorite, one of the best definitions of evil. Evil is the force which believes its knowledge to be complete. So it's you're, you're using an a incomplete map to inform and motivate action as if it were complete. And that seems to be the, the association with ideology and evil. Yeah, I, I love this section here. It's it's so good because it touches on such a main theme of what is currently wrong with society these days. I mean, the, the idea of ideological possession this is the story of the 20th century and and now of course into the into the 21st but th this gets into a little bit of even the the initial motivation for creating this book was that dr peterson was interested in understanding why did the atroc atrocities of the 20th century mm -hmm. happen why did people become possessed with ideologies fascism on the one hand nazism and communism on the other and everything in between and all of these negative things happen to the world, right? And this explanation is amazing. 
that they're incomplete pictures. They're only telling one side of the story. Mm -hmm. The example listed here, the examples listed here, I mean, they're brutal. Mother Nature is also malarial mosquitoes, parasitic worms, cancer, and sudden infant death syndrome. I mean, mm. those those are actually genuinely scary if, if they are real to you, right? And the thing about this is, this is completely, this is the part of the story that basically the modern day climate ideology is missing, that, that nature on its own or or anything that says that modern civilization should just completely take a back seat and stop dis destroying mother nature humanity is putting order into the world and mm -hmm. nature yes is is going to do all this creative stuff it's it's beautiful and all this but humans and most animals plants whatever are going to have a brutal and short life in mm -hmm nature mm -hmm. humanity has advanced itself to put order into the chaos of nature and of course sometimes nat order goes too far sometimes and and that's the opposite side of the story right where you have a story that says okay we humans have the right to go and just exploit whatever whatever we want whatever natural resources we want and there's no such thing as consequences, something like that. Okay, well, that's missing the story that that if all you do is consume, then there's nothing creative left. There's nothing left in nature to revivify and recreate once something is destroyed. It's the story of tyranny, basically. Mm -hmm. Another aspect of it. So what you need is something that merges the two. And, and first of all, the answer to the story about well over exploiting resources well the answer to that is low time preference first of all the idea that maybe you should uh save some things away for the future that's that's one pretty good idea i think but then then the other example here about about nature is that well yeah like humanity has to to tame this stuff and we we can't go back to a place where where um humanity is demonized for finding the energy and doing the things necessary to keep up human civilization now mm -hmm. right and the the opposite side of the story too with the climate narrative is that nature is is vulnerable somehow being destroyed by humanity right mm -hmm. but but nature is com is completely capable of completely destroying destroying what humans build up earth earthquakes and tsunamis being the the some of the most dramatic examples right that uh you know the the earthquake and tsunami in japan in 2011 creates a nuclear disaster that goes on for it's still going basically sort of mm -hmm. so so the the what i love about these passages about ideology right is that is that what I'm seeing in the world these days is complete ideological possession by one thing or another. Mm -hmm. And one of the answers is try and look at the complete picture. And that's what myth is here. Yeah. Yeah, it's... <clears throat> Again, what, what do we say a lot about the state and a lot of state actions involve this moral camouflaging. And so I can't help but see that here in the ideology, right? The, the ideology is an incomplete myth parading itself as complete information or like a complete story. So like, again, it's the, the proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing, right? It's the opposite of what it appears to be. And it, wants to appear that way that's the attractiveness right it's like oh here's the here's the answer here's here the answer we've been looking for um and it's because it is it's necessarily incomplete but it's representing itself as if it were complete completeness completeness entails that it's you know if it's contained if you've this is why the map is never the territory if you have 
the territory fully mapped, then you're not looking at a map anymore, right? You're looking at the territory. So if you claim to have a map that contains all the nuances and details of the territory, then you're using an incomplete story, representing it as a complete story. There is the attractiveness, right? It's almost like it's deceptively attractive, but it's also dead and static because it's it's to, it's total it's totalized knowledge it's totalitarian in that way and so it's this ideology representing itself as complete knowledge which as we said is evil right it's in an attractive form as he said that's what gives it its dangerousness and well so where do we see these ideologies from each according to their ability to each according to their need right it's like the oh it's the final solution it's the marxist utopia that's all we need to do and then when we actually try to implement this incomplete map in the sphere of human action, surprise, surprise, you create the opposite outcome, right? You have, it's the opposite of a utopia. It's a total dystopia. Tens of millions murdered, tens of millions starving to death, the collapse of the USSR, right? It totally failed. Nobody is safe until everybody is safe. The ideology of the pandemic, right? Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That's It's an incomplete, you can't, Safe according to who? Safe from what? Safe where? Safe when, right? It's all uh, the devil's in the details. It's all contextual. You can't say nobody is safe until everybody is safe. That doesn't make any sense at all. Um, I, I don't even know. It's just so ridiculous. Uh, there was a, a press release from the White House, from Biden's White House. These aren't anybody's children. These are everybody's children. Like that's a dangerous ideology. That is the communism of children, basically, saying they're not your children, parents. They're everybody's children, and we're going to jab all of them, basically, right? These are very evil, evil patterns uh, or stories, I guess. And then you look at mythology, which is the opposite, right? It's more, it's actually more complete, but recognizing itself as eternally incomplete, right? There's always this humility incorporated in mythology. It's not. And let, I mean, obviously there's the danger of dogma, but I think any true interpretation of mythology is exactly that. It's like, it's, it's open to interpretation at multiple levels of analysis, right? So there's a humility that comes with it. And so mythology is, as opposed to ideology, is something more like that mode of extracting the essential learnings from iterated human actions or human interactions across vast spans of time. And as such, it is living and dynamic, right? We can, we can always, it's always subject to revision, right? We were talking earlier about how technology changes, our metaphors change. And if mythology is this uh, compilation of our metaphors, well, then mythology is subject to change, which again is what Mercia Eliad said in his book, that mythologies tend to echo the technological paradigm they're created within. So they're constant, they're living stories, right? They're living and breathing rather than static and dead like ideologies. So what are some examples of this, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, right? We're talking about the primacy of mediation again. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, right? When people put material goods above people, well, you get the root of all kinds of evil. Um, and at the conclusion of this book, Peterson actually cites some lines from Christ who his people are asking him like, what should we do? Like, what is the main thing we should do? These are the, sorry to spoil the ending, but these are the concluding lines to maps of meaning. Christ responds, do not tell lies and do not do what you hate for all things are plain in the sight of heaven for nothing hidden will not become manifest and nothing covered will remain without being uncovered. Like these are deep, useful, living, breathing philosophical, mythological truths that I think stand in contradistinction to ideology, which are these, you know, sort of uh, compassionate sounding false ideologies that are intended to get you to follow a certain leader, right? And do what he says, which is typically let me steal your shit, basically, right? Like we look at Marxism 
from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Well, what is Marxism? The abolition of private property. The state owns everything. You own nothing. So like that's that's a very strong example of it. The pandemic. Nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Well, what is the purpose of that ideology? Let me print six to eight trillion dollars and steal from you, basically. Um, and let me invade your bodily autonomy with this experimental gene therapy. You know, it's evil, right? So anyways, I'll put it down there, but it's, I think this is one of the most critical distinctions human beings can come to understand is the line between a mythology and an ideology. Um, because again, we need this operating software. We need some story to inhabit or operate within but we have to be very careful about the story we select for ourselves um, because we're all are always vulnerable to falling prey to ideological possession. Yeah, I love it. Uh, fantastic, fantastic points there. I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, some other, the, the funny thing is it's the, the, the two big ideologies of the 20th century were, I'm going to steal all your shit. That's communism. Or I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, um, weaponize the entire society for external uh, warfare, right? Yeah. So uh, internal violence and external violence, basically. Yes. That's right. And and so the, the the real funny thing here is that uh, the the ideological side, the attractiveness of it. Mm. I think the the real reason for that is that if you take part of the story away, you can make it seem so easy mm. mm-hmm. and so attractive. Just just follow follow the charismatic leader and yes. you'll get you'll get the answer right and the thing about it is that the complete story is not that easy yeah the complete story says that there is a positive and negative to every aspect in the world and what okay so so one quote and and I'm paraphrasing this through through Peterson uh, he he used this this quote in, in some of his lectures but it's it's a Jung quote at uh, find out what myth you're living because you might not like what it is you have to find out again paraphrasing mm-hmm. top of my head but but it's i love love that quote because the thing about it is there is a danger in self-exploring self-examining because you might not like what you see about yourself and that's so so dangerous to confront so scary the work needed to overcome that it can be insurmountable. Some people don't do it. Some people don't manage it. But right. at least looking in the first place, honestly, that's the first step. And that's that's the entire reason why exploring mythology is so important to me. Mm-hmm. Because it's a way of finding these timeless stories these myths that actually tell the complete picture they have the positive and the negative and they have the outcome Mm -hmm. usually and the outcomes are sometimes not great if if one side is taking priority over the other right you get too much too much negative order you get a tyranny you get too much negative nature and the entire society gets collapsed in a flood something like that right but the the attractiveness bit Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's dangerous it's dangerous and so that so understanding that point i think that's the that's the the real point here yeah there's another thing that's just occurring to me as you were saying that that there's this subtle linguistic or perhaps even a conceptual line between an ideal and an ideology Right. So from each according to their ability to each according to their need, it's presenting itself as an ideal utopian situation. Um, and where it's obviously the opposite, right? Like it's not possible to have that in a, you can't scale that philosophy. It doesn't work. Maybe it works inside of a family, but it doesn't work for 8 billion people basically. Um, and this reminds me of a great quote from, I think this is Eric Weinstein. He said, the idealism of every age is the cover story for its greatest thefts. So these, be very careful that you don't get duped 
buy an ideal. And this is this thing we have to look at as ourselves with Bitcoiners, right? Because here we are pounding the sand saying, hey, we've found the ideal money or the, the big solution to so many problems in the world. But we have to check ourselves and we have to have the humility uh, that, you know, to think and address the possibility of having blind spots. And um, again, I, as I think open dialogue about these things, adversarial thinking, humility, being self-critical, critical of others, like these are all useful tools in preventing the possession uh, of, of ideology, even humor, right? They talk about when you can make fun of the the demagogue or the authoritarian, like that's a very useful tool in in dismantling the uh, the idealism they might put themselves within. And look who you can't make fun of in society, and you find out who's really in power, or something like that's that. That's right, Voltaire, I think, said that. Yeah, 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 and then and that's that's brutal. Yeah. The the funny thing here, and like another another thing with the the ideologies bit what i go f for from that is that mythology at least in the way this is being discussed as a complete story this isn't every religion it's not every part of every religious text mm -hmm. it's some core central message that mm -hmm. tells these stories properly and makes them true yeah every individual part of, for example, the Old Testament, where there are a whole bunch of rules for how you take a tribe of people and survive 40 years in the Sinai Peninsula Desert. Mm -hmm. Those are probably not true at the same level of analysis as the parts of Genesis that describe the creation of the world, the parts where Christ is leaving out his timeless wisdom, the stories of sacrifice on the cross. Those are different from the parts about the rules about not eating pork, for right. example. Sure. But as a, as a, as another point here, any any type of religion or uh, religious text that gets written down, the text part of it that stops it from being the living mythology that Eliade was referring yeah. to, right? right? You write it down. Suddenly, that's a snapshot. It's a snapshot in time that says yes. this was true now and so this stuff does not get revivified and re-updated if you keep it completely static yes right dogmatic dogmatic right so the, but it's difficult right yeah to me it's this is all just about saying don't look at this stuff as literal truth take out the elements that still make sense today yes that's what it tells me yeah it's it's man it's so tricky um a number of things here so one i there's a there's something in the quran and i i haven't read the quran this is second hand someone was saying like you're it's not a women aren't allowed to go a distance of like a certain amount of miles without a male escort for instance but the point that was made was well that was written at a time when people walked everywhere it does not it was not written at a time when we have automobiles right so that the distance needs to be changed for the new technological reality. So there is this, it's so tricky because obviously you need to write it down to transmit it across time. But when you write it down, you're, you're making it seem like it's fixed, right? And uneditable, unamendable. But that puts it in the domain of ideology in a way, right? Like dogmatism or ideology, which is dangerous, right? It's no longer adapting to the needs of new, the new reality, whether it's technological or social, whatever it may be. Yet you can't just arbitrarily willy nilly change and reinterpret the Bible all the time either. So there's some, again, middle ground that has to be struck. And um, yeah, I don't know. The, the, the Bible is interesting because I've heard Peterson talk about this, that, you know, Bible means something like library, that is actually a collection of books. It's not a single book and that it's changed over time, right? It's bit new books have been added. Other books have been discarded. Um, most more recently, 
Milton's Paradise Lost. I think like it's almost part of the Bible. Like it's maybe in 200 years, it'll be part of the biblical corpus. So you kind of like see this process playing out in real time. I don't know as much about the Quran. I don't know how it changes or adapts over time, but um, we need a somewhat living, breathing mythology to accommodate the living, breathing adaptivity of human consciousness over time. But you also need some just like he describes here, you need some stasis and structure inside of it as well. So it doesn't just um, arbitrarily change suddenly, right? You need, you need like some conservatism at the core and some fluidity at the edges, something like that. Sure. And I mean, the, the funny thing too is that the, I keep saying it like that, the, the, uh, the, the way that this stuff was transmitted over time before there was writing was oral tradition. And so it naturally had to be fluid naturally yes. had to be fluid and and so writing was this data compression tool this data retention tool and it's amazing it's got this all of these benefits why wouldn't you want writing of course I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying you wouldn't want writing you you want writing but you have to take the downsides and this parallels all technology you lose something something by new technology existing and maybe there was some benefit to the old way of doing things but if it was vastly more inefficient then you need to figure out ways to adapt yeah. use the new technology in the optimal way and the implication is that the optimal way is to still remember the reasons why things used to be done a certain way in this case the fluidity of the mythology of the stories. And again, the, the point here really being that the core mythological story has to still work, has to still make sense, has to not has to not lose the totalityness mm -hmm. that it, 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 it carries, right? Right. And having a snapshot, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with with having here, this book was written at, at this date, and the entire thing made sense the entire thing all of these stories w whatever they are rules these these all worked it's a snapshot yeah but it has to be updated yeah. that's that's it that's all that's all this is saying and and i i'm not i'm not saying at all that that b belief in the bible is is wrong no no no, no. It, but it is that that maybe some interpretation needs to be done and regarding every part of it as yes. literally right now literally literally still applicable fully today maybe that's maybe that's not right and there's much more of a problem with old testament than new testament i would say yeah. but yeah when when did it start ossifying right as you said the books kept on getting added i i, yes. I think it's at some point that that the uh the catholic church or what is now the catholic church mm -hmm. at some point they made some decision to stop well, yeah. what's who's to say that that can't be opened up again, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, very complicated. Very, very complicated. But I think there is actually uh, some guidance in the Bible on this. I forget which verse this is, but it's uh, fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, something like that. Which is now, if you if you actually look at the definition. The word that fear was translated from also means something like awe or reverence. And God is clearly this word that we use for the ineffable, right? That which the word we use for that which is beyond words. So if you reinterpret that verse, you'd say reverence or awe for that which is ineffable is the beginning of wisdom. And this parallels nicely with what Socrates said. He said, Soc Socrates said, the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms, right? That like the meaning is always somewhere in between, right? Because what's, what's the definition of terms? Well, it's other terms, it's other words. So it's, it's, it's context where we get the true meaning. It's not the text like fixed in place forever. Um, and so Again, just having humility and respect, like these stories are powerful. 
their highly compressed crystallized knowledge about how to act how to be you know morality etc but don't mistake it for fixed and final or complete knowledge because again that is the essence of evil itself so um you know i don't know there's it's hard you can't even give a hard and fast rule for this it's just like a heuristic because the whole that's to deal with reality requires heuristics there's not there's not rules for dealing with everything right you've got to you got to make judgment calls so um yeah sounds like kind of a cop out answer but i don't really know how to put it no 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 i love that point i that's exactly what i think as well is that is that life is about this constant mediation yes. right yes yes you have constant. too many you have too many rules you 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 well, what you you just never stray outside the rules. Uh, right. I guess that's the case, right? And if there's no rules at all, then life is total chaos. And I, I know some extremely chaotic people, and they have to get their lives together in order to do anything productive, right? So it's it's all of this. It's the heuristic. It it comes right back. It's the mediator between order and chaos. It's the heroes. Yes. That's the that's the summation of all of this. I think. Bingo, bingo. So good. Um, okay, where are we headed next? Well, the only other point from this chapter that I wanted to emphasize, just to kind of tie this chapter off so we don't have to yeah, re re revisit again, is, is just a little bit about, about how the individual gets initiated into the group, basically, as the precursor to, to freedom, becoming the... the actualized individual and just tying this back first of all into the point about discipline i think the reason these two points ideology uh, ideology and discipline are brought up together in this chapter are to say that sir overcoming ideology is through disciplining the individual the adolescent individual specifically into the group so that they get the baseline. Then after that, once they are essentially a complete individual, actualized individual, they can go out and, well, go be creative. But they need the baseline first. And so the entire way this happens is described in the process of initiation, essentially. And I, I, I could really dig into this but I, I think it's it's easiest just to to start with that the yeah here it is page um it's, it's still it's in it's in the first two darn pages um the oh uh, i lost it i won't i won't bother um uh no here it is here it is uh 220 my book i think that makes it 222 on yours just a child cannot live on its own alone it drowns in possibility the unknown supersedes individual adaptive capacity in the beginning it's only the transmission of historically determined behavioral patterns and secondarily their concomitant descriptions that enables survival in youth these patterns of behavior and hierarchies of value which children mimic and then learn expressly give secure structure to uncertain being mm. okay so really just to before i hand it over to you there the the base that i have here is that the job of the parent first of all parents and then more largely society as a whole is to give the the structure to the child so that they can actually grow into some form of actualized being that's capable of interacting mm -hmm. with its world and there are stages to that and all along the stages of growth there can be roadblocks along the way mm. and it's only when someone makes it all the way to the end basically that you can start to actually be a person that that is productive in the sense of producing more than just 
what is laid down to them, basically being the creative individual. So that that's the the point that the rest of the chapter I think is is mostly getting at. Yeah, and there's a sequence that occurs here too, right? So the parent provides that container that the child can grow into through imitation. And then eventually the parent has to kind of get out of the way and let the child go inhabit the container of their friends, right? The the broader social order that they then start to um, integrate with through also through imitation, interaction, et cetera. Um, a little further down, he writes that I'll read two parts here. He says, this means the tra that transformation of childhood dependency entails adoption of ritual behavior. Even regular meal at bed, meal and bedtimes are rituals and incorporation of a morality, a framework of reference with an inevitably metaphysical foundation. So you're really, again, that what we talked about at the beginning, this constraining structure right you're giving the cat the child regularity around which to build expectations right like we oh we have dinner at this time we go to bed at this time we brush teeth at this time etc and then you're also incorporating the morality which is the the mythology in a way right it's like how should you act around other people how is it how how do we treat people properly versus improperly etc and the next paragraph he writes, identification with the group, I'm sorry, I'll start with the beginning. Successful transition from childhood to adolescence means identification with the group rather than continued dependency upon the parents. Identification with a group provides the individual with an alternative, generalized, non-parental source of protection from the unknown and provides the group with resources of another soul. The group constitutes a historically validated pattern of adaptation specific behaviors, descriptions of behavior, and general descriptions. The individual's identification with this pattern strengthens him when he needs to separate from his parents and take a step toward adulthood, and it strengthens the group insofar as it now has access to his individual abilities. So again, it's that um, sequence of self-actualization that occurs through Imitation with initially just the parents, small group into a larger social context. Um, and, you know, with the aim or the ultimate intent of becoming a self-actualized, self-directed individual. Exactly. And the thing about it is that these steps need to happen, right? And in all cases, the consequences are, are highlighted somewhere in the in the chapter here like for example if if the child does not successfully be, mimic the behaviors of the the parents which is a which is a shorthand for saying they're not loved enough and i and i mean that literally that that they're they're not uh, given the the touch and the the necessary uh means to thrive mm -hmm. basically going up to from infancy to say being a, a young child if, if if that step doesn't happen, first of all, it, it yeah, it, it's impossible to <laughs> for at least someone to be completely well adjusted. I think there are always exceptions, but yeah, uh, but but then the the other point is that the the parent and and actually specifically the mother here. This is this is another, I would say, slightly controversial point here is that the. Uh, the child has to get out of the domain of the mother and mm -hmm. this is this is symbolic and literal at the same time mm -hmm. symbolically the child needs to overcome the loving positive force of nature that mm -hmm. is developing it and actually get out into society as in get a group of friends and start this concept of play with others of their peer group right but if you have a mother that won't let go basically or or either side if, if the if the kid won't let go of of the mother if either thing doesn't happen you don't get a successful uh launch right mm -hmm. and this could happen at any stage of development is also what is what is implied here that that 
basically, it, it doesn't have to be maybe maybe someone has a great childhood, but they don't manage to make the leap into high school. They don't thrive in high school, but then they go back to home and all this, right? It's it's the, you have to get past the symbolic and literal symbol of the mother to make it. And when it's when it's the case that the the mother won't won't let go of her child that's a different archetype and that's not even referenced here this comes from some other stuff but this is the devouring mother mm-hmm. archetype that feeds off her her children this is this is one of the <laughs> the scariest symbols in in mythological stories where yeah basically the the mother feeds off her children and and mm. won't let them go out into the world and and it's destructive there's there's symbols of the of the devouring mother everywhere because it's so common one of my favorites is the mother in the sopranos um who who is just absolutely bitter that her children do anything without her and she she tries to do all these little things to undermine them and to make everything about her right mm. and 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 so the the brutality of this is really just to say the, the actual point of this part is to say both both systems need to be working in in tandem here at the goal of the 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 structure of order and the and the creative aspect of nature both have to be aligned in the goal of that the child makes it into the culture and initiates into the culture Th- that goal has to be aligned father mother child all have to be aligned basically and when there are imbalances where you get maybe there isn't uh, enough of this um, group structure or social structure around absent fathers mm-hmm. right then the child is off to their own devices it's complicated yeah. stuff but it's it's all spelled out here that that basically this this process has to happen successfully or you get kids that fail to launch unfortunately yeah well said and um yeah, again this whole idea of the the necessity of some constraining structure in the beginning but if that constraining structure won't let go when the time is right, then it becomes oppressive or tyrannical. And that's where the archetype of the devouring mother fits in. Um, and it's, yeah, you, you, you're, you're, man, it's so it's pernicious, right? Because the mother thinks I'm doing what's best for my child, but she's actually creating this insulation between the child and the world. So the child's not able to adapt themselves to the culture and learn through pain and all of these things it's like the, it's it's hard i mean i can imagine it's very difficult right mother creates the child from her body and then eventually has to learn to let go and although that might feel like you're opening up your child and making them vulnerable you're actually strengthening them and making them worthy for participation in the world um so another one of those weird things where it's like you're doing what you think might be compassionate, right? Like buying into a certain ideology actually is its opposite. So we have to be cognizant of our potential for self-deception or again, ideological possession. Exactly. And the, the next step after this is the initiation. And this is, I think the, the last passage that I wanted to, to, actually read specifically here because it, it's just the the imagery is is so specific but it it, it draws upon the idea of that that all over the world there are these there are these initiation rituals between boy and man basically that where the boy goes in and is traumatized somehow and it, that's the word used it's 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 supposed to be a traumatic event they're taken away from their mothers the women aren't allowed to participate this is this is across cultures not universal but almost and then afterwards they are a man and first of all it it there's a a distinction here that 
this isn't necessarily needed for for girls because nature imposes maturity on them mm, by right. by the the earlier onset in puberty and menstruation basically oh. their their maturity is is forced upon them but but boys have to be initiated and and so the passage passage goes from page 223 my my side the, the boys know that they are to be introduced to some monstrous power who exists in the night, in the forest or cave, in the depths of the unknown. This power, capable of devouring them, serves as the mysterious deity of the initiation. Once removed from their mothers, the boys begin the ritual. And then skipping ahead a little, when the rite is successfully completed, the initiated are no longer children dependent on the arbitrary beneficence of, na- beneficence of nature in the guise of their mothers, but are members of the tribe of men, active standard bearers of their particular culture, who have had their previous personality destroyed, so to speak, by fire. Mm. They have successfully faced the worst trial they are likely ever to encounter in their lives. Mm. And that's initiation. Trial by fire. Indeed. And the standard, I like the, the active standard bearers um, again, we're, we're talking about people being like God's money, right? Between the the medium of exchange between heaven and earth. That's what these men are becoming, right? They carry the cultural knowledge into the future. So they're mediating the transmission of ideals across time and space through action, right? Through this initiatory process. Um and and just yeah. just to just to note here as well is that this this specifically brings the 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 individual into the state of adopting the shared map, basically. Mm-hmm. It, these initiation rituals aren't necessarily the point of going beyond that to becoming the creative, self actualized individual. Right. It's the point of disintegrating the the child, right, and then emerging you adopt the shared map of the culture so that's right. that's this stage and and it's it's incomplete definitely yes. but it's the the death and rebirth of the adolescent initiate uh, the, this figure on page 224 right. the, the point primary. of enculturation but this again is a prerequisite to any expansion of the cultural frontier that he may do as a as a heroic figure right um so yeah, that's a great point. They're actually yeah, you're mapping, you're taking the cultural map of history and getting the download effectively, and then you become the standard bearer or the actor, cultural actor that can that is responsible for expanding the frontiers of culture going forward. Exactly, and so I think to to sum up what this chapter is trying to get at here, because it is is a very short and dense chapter and and we've we've stayed in the the first few pages basically the whole time but i think the real point here is that there is some form of this disciplining and initiation required to adopt the shared map that at least is an attempt a cultural attempt to make sense of the world around and give a baseline for creating this true freedom and mm-hmm. So as as we were saying in the beginning, with the the entire idea that that there needs to be some form of order imposed to create freedom, it's, it's counterintuitive. But this this is the part that makes me think that we can't just immediately have Ancapistan and and everything is everything is just right. complete free for all. Right? We yeah. do have to have some of the bounds of of civilization and the ideas from the past. And freedom means might mean different things. Like there's not there's not necessarily this this state as a as an entity that's that's here imposing rules, but culture maybe should impose some rules on the people participating in that culture. Right. Yeah, again, yeah, the constraints are necessary even in Ancapistan, as you call it, which which I think we're saying is anarcho-capitalist country basically the constraint the ideal constraint would be inviolable private property right this whole thing of my 
fist ends where your nose begins, right? Like we can't, we can do whatever we want up to the boundaries of other people's person and property, basically. So even in this ideal liberalized world, right? This anarchic world, no, no rulers, just rules. There's still rules, right? There's still constraining structures, uh, particularly private property. Um, and presumably Bitcoin, right? is like the strongest form of private property. I can't imagine what other money uh, in Kapistan would use other than Bitcoin. Yeah, it's, it, I, this term comes up a fair bit when, when me and Knut are discussing hyper-Bitcoinization and it's just the shorthand term for here's the the state of the world after this. It's also fun for thought experiments. Like, is this really going to work in Encapistan or how does this yeah. look like in Encapistan? It's, it's yeah. but it's, yeah. it's partially in jest, but in all seriousness, it is, is, it is to say, I think we don't ever get to a state where there is complete lack of, of rules. I, I, again, with the, as you say, the start is the, yes. is the, the, the private property, but I think there's, there, this is saying there's more to that. I think this yeah. is saying there is more to that, that the cultural memory says prescriptively sort of here is what you should do in order to live a good life yeah. feel free to ignore it but well, it's what you probably should do yeah feel free to modify it right at the edges you know like it's not and it's well yeah it is prescriptive because it is distilled wisdom right it's here's what we've been acting for X 10,000 years, here's what we've learned up until this point. You're carrying that knowledge. Like it's not final. We know reality changes. We know technology changes. We know, you know, it's always shifting and moving. So feel free to modify this as you go. Now that you are the standard bearer, right? You can be the cultural pioneer, so to speak. Um, but don't dispense with it entirely or, I mean, do whatever you want, but dispense with it at your own peril. Let's say like, it's very, it's very much like Lindy effect in a way, right? It's like, this has worked for so long. You know, if it's not working for some reason, maybe you should sort of check yourself and your orientation before you just try to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Um, and yeah, it's a good, it sounds like the, the ritual, the ritual initiation process too, is a good way of injecting humility, which is the proper orientation to culture in general, right? Like you are one actor among billions probably that have ever carried that particular culture. It's very unlikely you figured out something that hasn't already been figured out, right? Like maybe, maybe, but probably not. No, well, the more likely thing is you figure out the new way to do it that yeah. works better now. That's right. That's but right. something completely new, probably not. And, That's right. and the thing is, there are plenty of people that, that, are well adjusted and life works for them. Yes. And maybe they're worth listening to. The things yes. that they've done that have worked for them, maybe that's worth listening to. And yes. this is one of the core themes of the book that I think is is part of this antidote to nihilism that yes. is being addressed. And so maybe this is the the thing to do if uh, someone is is having a crisis of meaning and what to do. Well maybe one of the things is to look at the wisdom of the past and look at what works for the people who are doing well. Bingo. Yeah, man, as you're saying that, even the tremendous path breakers like Satoshi, right, created, created probably the most significant innovation humans may ever see, at least for the next several hundred years. I mean, it's on the order of like the wheel and fire and electricity, right? It's very very significant innovation but even that is an ancient principle in a new implementation right he's basically taking private property which we've known about for eons and he's making it stronger than ever so as he's not dispensing with cultural knowledge he's actually building upon it it's like oh this is what's worked but now we have these new tools to implement it in a stronger way let me do that, right? Let me make the contribution. So again, there's a humility, you know, it's not, it's not this, um, there's not an arrogance there, I guess you would say. He's learning from the past and building upon it rather than just trying to create a new 
thing uh, by itself. Which, by complete contrast, creators of these cryptocurrencies and other tokens mm -hmm. are seeing what was done there, this immense innovation, and they do not act with humility when they think that they can create something better. That's right. Yeah. So there is no second best, as someone else that's, that's smart said, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's so true. And then um, uh, also like the whole transhumanist, globalist, utopian thing where, again, you're just back to this thing of acting on knowledge that you think is complete. It's like, oh, we haven't figured out. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to reduce the global population to 500 million. We're going to put everyone in a, a pod. Everyone's going to eat bugs. No more meat. You know, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, what are you talking about? You you're making these plans for like centuries into the future. We can't even predict the weather three to five days in advance. Like who, how much hubris can you possibly have? So anyways, I hope we can adopt a more humble orientation and, um, you know, incrementally innovate the culture rather than trying to overhaul it. I think this is exactly what all this is saying. So couldn't agree more. Beautiful. Luke, man, we went the full time again. Uh, really enjoyed it. And I guess next time we will be getting into chapter four. Really enjoy it as well. And yeah, sounds like a great plan. We wanted to cover that today, but yeah, I really enjoyed digging into this even more. So this was fantastic. Thanks again for having me. Agreed, man. Talk to you soon. Sounds good. Take care.